Welcome, everyone, to the SoCal Car Scene Podcast, the exclusive place for coverage of car culture in Southern California and the personalities that drive it. I'm your host, Dean Marash. Joining us today is legendary race car driver, Lynn St. James. But before we get started, I need to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by our good friends at SeaTech and Wicked Automotive Detailing. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, The SoCal Car Scene, because you never want to miss an episode. Let me take a few minutes and introduce you to our very, very special guest today, Lynn St. James. Lynn is a very accomplished race car driver, as I'm sure all of you or most of you know, highly sought after public speaker and author. Her accomplishments on the racetrack are significant, such as Indy 500 Rookie of the Year, seven-time Indy 500 driver, victories at Daytona 24 hours, Sebring 12 hours, Watkins Glen, and Road America. She set 21 national and international close course records at over 225 miles an hour. Amazing. She has also numerous awards and recognitions, but a few that really stand out to me are Sports Illustrated Top 100 Women Athletes of the Century and Working Women, one of 350 women who changed the world between 1976 and 1996. Most recently, Lynn was named to the Sebring Hall of Fame. What an honor. And maybe you've read one of Lynn's books, An Incredible Journey, Oh, By the Way, or The Car Owner's Manual. Lynn is also the former president of the Women's Sports Foundation and founded the Women in the Winter Circle Project Podium Grant and has made significant contributions to motorsports, both on and off the track. As a motivational speaker, Lynn has presented to companies such as Bosch, Ford Motor Company, HSBC, Merrill Lynch, Nike, GTA, and GTE, just to name a few household names. Her legacy of one is one of inspiration, encouragement, perseverance, and commitment to excellence. Lynn, thanks so much for joining us on the SoCal Car Scene. Thanks. It's so funny listening to that. Is <laughs> it's it? Like reading, well, it's like you're reading it about somebody else. I mean, <laughs> is it I almost think. surreal? It is. It's like the first time I probably really listened. Um, to when somebody introduces me and reads all, I mean, I've, you know, I've seen that in writing and I just tend to gloss over it and listening to it. I mean, I I hate to say this, but I'm going to just say it. It's like, wow, who is that person? That's really impressive. (laughs) Even you were impressed. I know. And it's like, (laughs) (laughs) listen, I cut out a lot of good stuff. I was, that was the hard part. I got to get this done quickly. How do I do this? So, (laughs) well, it's an honor to have you on and I'm glad you uh, are, are, you know, just what a body of work, a legacy, if you will. I hate to use such trite sayings, but that's what comes to mind when I when I read that and uh, whittled it down to that bio. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Seriously. Hey, well, well like we said, we'll kick it off with some racing stuff. And, you know, that's, you know, a lot of it, uh, you know, from your past. And then we'll transition into the exciting things you got going. You're, you're so involved in many aspects of uh you know, not just motorsports world, but uh, motivating people. So we, we want to get to some of that great stuff as well. But what do you give credit to for getting you interested in race cars? You know, I, it's really hard. I, I you know, I grew up in the, in the 60s um, when the muscle car era, you know, so the car culture was really strong and rich. I grew up in the Midwest, um, you know, in Ohio. And so I don't know, it just seemed like My mom loved cars. My mom, you know, taught me how to drive. My mom was one of those, you know, she was a car person really. And, and then my buddies were car people and I went to a girl's school. So my buddies liked having me around because that could introduce them to new girls (laughs) where they went to school and the girls, the girls school liked me because, you know, I had access to guys um, and all those guys were into cars. So it just, that sort of probably just created the foundation, but it didn't, you know, didn't really mean anything at the time. Um, And then um, I went to the Indy 500. I I did some drag racing uh, with my buddies. Um, And I mean, how can you not go to the Indy 500 and go, holy cow. I mean, you know, I mean, it was mind boggling, but I never, people have said in writing, oh, I said, you know, I'm going to race there someday. Never, 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 never crossed my mind. Well, how, ad, how incredible is it that it was in your backyard and you had a chance to go use it as a playground, you know? I'm yeah, like, I mean, I went twice um, in, in my younger years. And yeah. so it, it, it was actually a great opportunity, I think, to, to probably create something 
of no unknown, you know what I mean? Even though it yeah. wasn't a goal and it was, but there was still a knowledge about it um, by visually, by certainly, by actually being there as opposed to watching it on TV or, you know, something like that. But anyway, fast forward, I moved to Florida. Um, I uh, went to the 24 hours of Daytona, which was my very first road race that I ever saw. So this was a completely different experience and I was married at the time. My husband um, and I were both really just totally blown away. And we just said, we got to figure out how to do this. <laughs> and, um, and so, but of course it was focused more on him doing it, but that was okay. I mean, in the beginning, right. I was like, I was the, you know, I was the pit crew. I was, I made the sandwiches and did the timing and scoring and, you know, but that didn't last too terribly long when I realized, Hey, you know, I really like to drive and I like to drive fast. So I want to do this too. And he was very supportive. So we, we was helped. He? Oh yeah, no, I mean, he, goes, he got it. And so uh, he said, let me get my first, my race car done first and then we'll take care of you. Um, and my first race car was a Ford Pinto, which was my <laughs> no <way>. street car. <laughs> it was my street car and it was a new class that SCCA started in 1973 and it was called showroom stock. And of course it is not only blossomed, it is really expanded. You know, now we're production-based racing with production-based cars that are just slightly right. modified you know, it's all over the country. I mean, it's incredibly popular. At the time, it was not very popular, but it was accessible financially and mechanically and technically. You couldn't modify the car. You know, you it was, I could go out and buy the car and have it as my street car. So, it, and then have it as a race car because we couldn't afford to have two race cars in the family. So it was um, the way it got started. And, you know, so, to be- yeah. Well, that's I amazing never, because you hear so many stories it always seem to start with racing crews with, midgets on dirt tracks or uh, fathers, you know, uh, you know, influencing young people. And it's for you, it's your mother and Pintos. That makes you even rarer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, really, I actually say that my career is not replicable. I, nope. mean, the way I, I was only, I was 27 when I started. Um, so I was too old. I was the wrong gender. And I started a class that was not popular and that was not considered real race cars. I mean, all the things that were wrong, but it was the only thing you have going for you. I mean, it's the only way to go, you know, at the time. And so I had no big plans. I didn't know. I just, I was always about getting ready for the next race, getting right. ready to learn and overcome whatever it is you screwed up, <laughs> you know, because you always in the beginning are screwing up. And so, you know, it's like those you fail so much in racing. And I think yeah. that's what really tests you as a person, but it also tests your passion. It yeah. tests your desire and- um, Your commitment, was, right? I was in your commitment and I was tested often. And I believe in life and in society, which is what I do when I'm doing my motivational speaking is I talk a lot more about failure right. because what racing gives you, it, it gives you plenty to work with. <laughs> um, and then it always gives you those carrots of, success, you know, checkered flags and being there first and getting awards or getting, collecting your trophy at the end of the weekend. Right. I mean, there's always that something there that goes, I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of baseball. You know, <clears throat> if you're a great baseball player, you hit 300, which means you get a hit one in every three at bats, but most people probably hit about 250 to 260. So one in every four hits. And you know, that there's a lot of failure in those numbers. And Sports or racing is worse. I mean, yeah. how many times do you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I think sports is why, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm such a proponent of, you know, after Title IX came out, which I was a pre Title IX, you know, yeah. young, I was a youth, a female youth that would have not had sports had I not gone to a girls' school pre Title IX. And that's why I'm such a proponent on, I don't care if you'd never pursue sports as a, or it doesn't even matter if you're any good at it. So it's not a matter of being good or a matter of wanting to be an Olympic athlete or a pro athlete. It's what you learn about through about yourself and about life through sports. And you can't read that in a book. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great point. We, <clears throat> we've had a lot of uh, guests on our show that are, you know, executives and, and, and you know, very accomplished people like yourself. And I think sports is a, is just great discipline from a teamwork standpoint, from uh, hard work, dedication, commitment, and perseverance. And like no other, like no other um, extracurricular activity, do you get that? It's just, it's all there for the taking and, and to help develop young people, I think. It's really important. 
Hey, so I want to switch gears just a little bit. You, one of the things I mentioned in your bio is, and you know, some of those speed records you set, you going over 225 miles an hour. I know you qualified at Indy faster than that. I think. What What the heck is it like to go 200 miles an hour? And is is it something you get comfortable with at some point, or is there always that like, okay, let's you know, let's re- try to remind ourselves what's happening here. Explain that to us. That never. Happened. One of the beauties of racing is that we don't have speedometers. I mean, you really don't know how fast you're going. I mean, once I got past the, you know, the Pinto and the, and the production-based cars, right. I mean, you really, you're dealing no with a tachometer, you know? and, and so you really don't have a specific number. Um, the feel, though, I can tell you, it's a progressive thing. I mean, you don't just go out and go over 200 miles an hour. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I started, you know, in the production type cars where I was going 120, 140, and then I got into the higher, speed, you know, faster production cars, Corvettes, you know, I was going 180. But I can tell you, once you kind of hit this, this um, invisible wall, I, I don't want to, I hate use the word wall because racings are, you know, yeah. those are, this is an invisible one. Once you get over 200 miles an hour, things change um, very dramatically. And, and so, and, and what changes is, is, this, is the, the amount of time you have to react to everything. I mean, to what you see and what you feel. Right. And so it, it literally, you are so busy processing um, what you see and what you feel, you don't know how you feel. You only are dealing with what you feel. So there's no, since in my, at least personally, there's no sensation um, about the speed. I mean, when I went to Talladega with the Thunderbird, no kidding. Um, yeah. you know, it's a big, heavy car. Um, to be honest, the car was numb. I mean, I, I never knew what the heck I was doing other than looking at, at tachometer. And when I would lose 50 RPMs, it would take me sometimes two laps to get that 50 RPM back because just the, those cars are like sleds. I mean, they're like, I, I mean, I hated it, to be honest with you. So, <laughs> no kidding. Um, Oh my God. I, I mean, I had the intention when I did that program in 1988 and I convinced Ford Motor Company, Goodyear and the Elliott's to build a purpose-built car to go to Talladega. The goal, yes, was to make a respectable women's close course speed record. But the ultimate goal for me was that I was going to convince Ford Motor Company that I could be a stock car driver. Right. And so I was trying to transition from being a road racer to being a stock car driver because I knew that's where Ford was really focusing and that was where the big time was you know and so and that whole two or three days that we were there um i i'm like i i remember saying that bill bill elliott built the car hitting you know, his, his team and at one point he stuck his head in the car in the in the window you know in the side window and he goes so so how you doing you know obviously i came in the pits and he goes so how you doing and i'm like I don't know who's driving this because it's not me. I can't feel the car. I said, the car is just doing it on its own. And I either, I either hinder it or maybe do something right, but I have no idea what I'm doing, you know, or what, what it's doing. And he goes, well, you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. I never got used to it. Um, three weeks later, I drove an Indy car. I tested an Indy car for the first time because Dick Simon gave me that opportunity. Right. And I instantly knew this is what I want to do because you feel everything. I mean, that car tells you, everything you've just told it to do and it you better be right and um i loved it i absolutely loved it so the feedback the sensations were there in the open wheel and not so and much the response everything you know but again not speed defined i mean you know but i can also tell you at indy when you're when i was running I think it was the third year in 94 and I kind of got stuck at, at um, 219 or 220, I think it was. And and I said to Dick, I know this car can go faster, but I don't know how, how, or how it's going to feel. I don't know what to do. I don't want to blow it. I don't want to hit the wall. So he put Raul in it, who was a teammate, Raul Bozell. And he went out and did 221 and said, came back in. And I'm like, so, so how is it? You know, I wanted feedback. I wanted information. And he goes, car's good. That's all he told me. Car's good. I'm like, thank you. But can you, car's good. He walked away. I got in the car and I went out and went 222. I mean, I literally made a leap because at one mile an hour at Indy average over, you know, is, is a huge deal. So, so there are, but it's feel, it's feel. It isn't, it isn't like you can't process it. You know, you're so, not going, wow, that really felt 
you know. And, you know, like speeds over 200 miles an hour, 225 or <clears throat> whatever. It's incredible to me how much the brain it can process and handle. Um, and, you know, not only take in that information, but uh, process it through your hands and your feet and your eyes. And I got to wonder if the brain itself is a overlooked factor for a lot of drivers that can just process the information and then transition it uh, expediently to their, you know, their body parts that manage the car. I mean, we don't talk much about this, but have you, have you just, you know, explored any of that or discussed that with some well, of your peers? Sure, I have actually. I mean, um, I worked very closely with Dr. Jacques Delaire, who sometimes, if you ever want to have an interesting person on. Um, What's his name, Dr. Jacques? Dr. Jacques Delaire, D-A-L-L-A-I-R-E. -A -A and he, he has been testing and training race car drivers for decades. Um, and I've been working with him back in the 80, late 80s. And I mean, there is actually a way to define the processing um, and, and the way each individual race car driver's brain processes information um, and how you can improve your processing skills. I mean, our mind is nothing more than a computer. I mean, we're just human right. computers, you know? And, and, and so um, that really helped me a lot, um, it, to, particularly at Indy, <laughs> because that was a huge leap uh, in many, many ways. So, and, and I'm working now um, with actually this upcoming, they just had this week, I was on the CES shows, uh, a panel on the CES show on wow. the Ind Autonomous Challenge, which is a unit, 30 universities around the world are putting teams together and they are going, they are working with Delara and they are going to take an Indy Lights car and with all of them are given the software, but then they have to program that software to make a driverless autonomous competition <laughs> that's going to take place in Indianapolis in October Wow, 20. that's exciting. And I said to them, when I did this interview, on, it was on Tuesday, I said, the, the magic is going to be, can the, can the computers replicate, figure out on how to replicate the race car driver's intuitive anticipatory reaction that we do in milliseconds that in we don't even know we're processing? And I can yeah. tell you, if I've aged, the processor has slowed down. I know <laughs> it cannot right. go out go as fast as I used to go. Right. So, but that's what has to happen for autonomous vehicles to really be safe, you know, to be able to have that sort of intuitive anticipatory reaction, to be able to anticipate and react before an incident or before something happens. It, it's so, kind of like when you're driving the freeway and you see somebody, two or three cars in front saying, you know, that guy's driving like an idiot. I'm moving over to the left. You probably see the same thing on the racetrack going, you know, I, I don't like what's happening with Bill Elliott or, you know, one of, one of these other guys that's out in front of you. You're like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going down on the bottom or something. I mean, I'm sure it just, you don't even think about it, but you just go do it. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's a very just, good analogy, you know, and my mom was the one who taught me on, on freeways to watch the front tires of the cars on either side of you, because you will literally see, the tires start to move before the car actually moves. You'll see no that. No kidding. I've never yeah. looked at that. Okay. Never forget something my mom. Else for, something else for my pea brain. I look forward to trying that. Um, well, thanks for sharing that with us. That was fascinating. But real quickly, did you have a favorite? I mean, you look, I, I looked at, like like I said, when I prepared your bio, you have, you've been involved in so many different racing series, like a lot of your peers and people from your area, it seemed like you went from Indy to Sebring to Le Mans and Trans Am and, you know, all these road courses around the world. Was there something that was your fave? Is there such a thing or? Well, my favorite has always been endurance racing. And the reason okay. why, a couple of reasons. One is you get a lot of seat time because the races are always over too, too soon. You know, I'm like, I want more, I want more. Yeah. Um, and it's a team effort. It's a really team effort. And I love the human dynamics, the interaction. When you have a really cohesive team, um, you can make magic happen. And I, so I love endurance racing. Uh, so obviously being able to first, well, it was the first road race I ever saw was a 24 hours of Daytona. And so being able to actually race it to 24 hours a, num a number of times and to win it twice, and then to go to Le Mans, um, you know, it, it, in, in, 19, in 1989, um, when I went to Le Mans for the first time, I thought, you know, it was really funny when things happen, like winning at Daytona, you know, being in the podium and, and, and victory circle, I should say, and then, and then thinking it is never going to get any better than this. This is like the ultimate. 
And then I'm racing at the 24 hours of Le Mans. It is never going to get any better. This, this is the ultimate. Then winning at Sebring. Oh my God, this is like the ultimate, it's, you know. And then <laughs> go to Indianapolis. Oh my God, it's, I can't believe it. I don't think my feet touched the ground the whole month of May. And then to win Rookie of the Year. Oh my God, you know, and then to go back. I mean, it, it, it it's that kind of stuff that I've been, God, I've, I've worked hard, but I've been so, so, so blessed. And so, um, but endurance racing will always be a core my favorite, you know, I mean, I love to watch Indy and I love open wheel. I love driving an open wheel car because of that response. And I mean, I drove, I've raced some vintage races in a yeah. form Atlantic car and I love it, you know, sure. but, but to really say what my favorite is, it's endurance racing. Hey, uh, selfishly, I, I looked, I noticed that you, um, like Scott Pruitt, you drove a Merker XR4 TI and Trans Am or IMSA. Yeah. Um, and um, I had an XR4 TI in, back in 85 or 86. I, yeah. felt like I, I felt like I was only the weird dude on the planet that had one, but I was so in love with the turbocharged four. But then I started volunteering down at, um, you know, Long Beach Grand Prix. And that's where I saw, I think you went to Long yeah. Beach Grand Prix, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, saw, I was there a number of times. Yeah, I finished on the podium there. I finished yeah. third. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, there was nothing better than that series. The noise those cars made. I, know. I, I enjoyed watching them more than the Indy cars. And still to this day, you listen to those cars go around the track. There was something magic about them. Maybe I got a bias. No, I, I agree. With, well, maybe I do too, because I did compete in it. But I seriously, I get so upset with these guys that are in the historic Trans Am series. You know, I'm like, when are you guys going to get to the 80s? You know, you're stuck in the 60s, you know, in the 70s. Yeah. But the 80s were the best. You know? I think they were. Yeah. I absolutely think they were. Yeah, Long Beach Grand Prix, that really got my blood boiling because I grew up in NorCal. I came down here and I'm like, okay, this is this is life. I finally discovered <laughs> about watching people like you do your magic on that track. So you won, you won it uh, Long Beach. No, I came in third, came in third. Didn't wow, win. that's I'm pretty impressive. Third. Wow, what a, what a great road course and, and what a great event. I'll tell you what, I can't get enough. I wish I went to India, I've never been. Oh, you gotta do it. I mean, you gotta. It's on the bucket list. Yeah, it's one of those, you just have to do it. It'll it's gonna wrap up with racing, but you know, what? what's the one thing you notice that's radically different today than you know, like in either open wheel or, or on these endurance races. I mean, think about, you know, safety has radically changed. We see cars go upside down and flip and, and fire. I mean, the one, that one F1 race uh, a couple a month ago where that guy split that, you know, uh, barrier and the car cut in half, caught fire immediately. You know, a few seconds later, he walked out and, you know, I, so... Safety is the biggest thing that comes to my mind, but what do you see other than safety if, is the difference between then and now? Well, safety is the most positive and the most productive and the most dramatic, I think, changes. I, I mean, I, I remember when Ayrton Senna died in 1994, I was at Indy, it was in May, and, and oh, man. It, shocked, it shocked all of us, you know? And, and then obviously um, when Dale, when Dale senior, you know, when Dale died um, and I yep. think that was a one, um, those were two, our heroes aren't supposed to have, you know, to, to have right. happen in a race. And so I think since then, this I, safety from my perception, I mean, this is a fairly risky thing probably to say, but I think there was a, a fear from the sanctioning bodies or a, maybe fear isn't the right word, but a reluctance to go down that path because of, you know, of, of, of the law of being sued and, you know, wh where's the responsibility when we all sign waivers, but we know those waivers probably aren't really valid when you, if you can get down to it. So, and so even though there's always been encouragement of safe driving and safe racing and safe, you know, I mean, it, it's, I'm not saying they've ignored it. I'm just saying I think they avoided it as much as they could because of the of the repercussions that could possibly come out of it. After um, those two events, and there's a gap between them, I mean, 94 to 2001, um, but really that that has changed. And now everybody has stepped up, everyone, every sanctioning body has stepped up and, and said we have to, and, and the race tracks. I think one of the big safety changes were the, were the safer barriers. Um, you know that on the walls at Indy, um, and and now it, it raced started at Indy, and now racetracks all over the country. So safety is for sure the most positive change from the way it was to the way it is. 
Um, <clears throat> so anything <laughs> else that strikes you? Well, different? I'm going to pick one because I think it's kind of, it's, it's a negative change, I think, is that it's become so professional that the drivers and even to a certain degree, the other characters, <laughs> let's just call them, you know, whether it's crew members or team owners or whatever, but the, you know, people are interested in people. And I mean, there are, there's definitely a hardcore group of people that are going to follow racing because they love cars. Right. And, and I know you're a car show, so I'm sure that's your audience. They, they love cars right. and they're going to, they're going to follow it no matter what the heck's going on. You know, right. they don't really care. In fact, in many cases, who the people are, you know, because <laughs> they just want to see those cars. Right. But to, the sport has grown so much. And I think that at least from my perspective, people are interested in people. That's one of the reasons why I have had some success, I think, was because I was different and, you know, and, and there were people that was like, wow, you know, they took some interest. So, and I think that when you look back at Mario's and Pernelli's and Gurney's and you look back at that era when, when those were interesting people and they were who they were, they, they didn't have to be so careful about who they were. Um, in, in a public way. I mean, they were, you, what you saw is what they were, you know, what you got. And so today I've just seen, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of the people are, I mean, I know we have to be politically correct and we have to be careful about some things. Sure. I mean, I'm not saying that we should be, have a free for all and be wide open, but I just think that that's gotten so polished um, that a lot of people just can't be who they are. And, um, and then there's a cookie cutter that the team owners are looking for. Right. Yeah. I think, I think you really see that come to fruition in F1. You know, these kids are all coming on the scene at 21 or whatever, and they've spent their whole life, you know, driving cars since they were three and you get a million hours of, uh, you know, gaming. And so it, it's almost like, it's like, were they created or is this their passion or, you know, the, so you got to wonder about this, you know, you know, I think the reason why we love, uh, Earnhardt so much was his personality. I think, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. He, well, he, I mean, he's gone down. I mean, in the era of his his, here, his era, I mean, whether it was you know Ricky Rudd, Bill Elliott, Dale Earnhardt, they all were different, yeah. you know, and they yeah. all they all kind of they walked, you know, they walked in their own shoes and they kind of marched to their own, you know, drum and yeah. um, and that's what created a fan base. I mean, and Jeff Gordon came along, which was completely different, and you know. So I just think, and in IndyCar, you know, we could go on and on and, and name the names of all the different sanctioning bodies. So I don't think it's just F1. I think it's it's across the board. Across the board, yeah. I, and I think that's one of the reasons why women, quite frankly, are the opportunity. It's the biggest growth potential because we're yeah. different, if nothing Absolutely. else, you know. And, and you've, when you look at like an, an NHRA, you take an Erica Enders, you take a Leah Pruitt, you take even Melanie Troxel, who unfortunately, you know, is no longer racing, but I was a huge fan of hers. And um, you, the four sisters, I mean, every one of them, and, and I mean, for heavens, Shirley Baldowney, every one of them had a very unique personality. And so there's that differentiation, and, you know, by gender. And then if you even look at some of the other uh, ethnic, you know, differentiations and, and, and and, and I think NRA, NHRA has been one of the, the most successful at providing some diversity. And when I'm they really have about, done a great job, haven't they? Yeah. I'm not talking about the buzzwords of diversity. I'm just talking you about unique differences, you know, um, and they, they create excitement and they create interest and they create fans. Yeah, the Force family comes to mind. You know, they're, yeah. we're, they're, they're right up the street in Europe. Can't polish right John Force. <laughs> You know, from John Force to his daughters to the the brother-in-law, you know, it just the you know, it's just what an incredible uh, mentorship, you know, he does. And so, you know, well, it, that's one guy who's a big character, like we were talking about in the past. You may not see it going forward, but we need more of those. You can't polish John Force. I mean, he no, is, no, there's no polishing. I've seen, that I've seen <laughs> him in a couple of press conferences, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, let me take a minute and thank one of our awesome sponsors, Lynn. Are you looking for a smarter way to charge your car's battery? Our friends at SeaTech lead the way in care and maintenance of vehicle batteries. SeaTech's unparalleled knowledge and continuous investment in innovation means they offer high quality, reliable chargers that are effective, easy to use, and most importantly, safe for the user 
and their car's electric system. The quality of CTEX products make them the trusted company of the world's most recognizable car brands. Get yours today at smartercharger.com and type in the code SOCAL, all caps, at checkout and get a 10% discount on all CTEC products. All right, Lynn, there's many, many women in racing today that probably, whether or not you want this burden or not, think of you as the person they look up to or provided you, you were probably a mentor. How difficult was being a trailblazer it, during those days? Um, and, and do you accept and embrace this, uh, you know, this, this, this notion of being a trailblazer and, and really making, you know, making way for a lot, lot of the women that are on the scene today? Well, I, first of all, celebrate the fact that there are so many women now racing. I mean, God, I'm just, I remember back in the 90s when I would be interviewed often, obviously at Indy, and yeah. I would talk about these drivers, you know, and they're like, where are they, Lynn? Where are they? I'm like, they're coming. I swear to God, they're coming. <laughs> and it took a while. There was a longer than I anticipated. But um, I, so I celebrate the fact that there's so many women. I mean, in every category. Every, I mean, we could go on and on and on just listing the different gals in the different categories. And, and I just absolutely celebrate that and love it. Um, you know, I, as I said to you earlier, you couldn't replicate my career. So yeah. I, I try to stay relevant about not me, but I stay relevant about the sport. I try to know what's going on in every sanctioning body, in every series, um, because it constantly changes. You know, the, 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 the rules change, the, every, the philosophy for the, the, some of the series changes and all of that so that I can give good advice in my ability to mentor the up and coming drivers. Cause I don't mentor them based on, well, this is what I did right. um, because it, it isn't relevant what I did. But what, when I, when people ask me, well, how hard was it? Or well, how does it feel or whatever? You know, I was blind. I, I, I literally, I, I was fortunate early on um, to kind of get enough crap that and I remember my husband, who was a really, really good guy. And I remember him saying, Lynn, every one of those are nothing more than distractions. If you fight those battles, you get into those discussions, it's going to take time and energy away from your ability to get better and to be who you, you know, to be who you are and to be better at who you are. And, and so, and I, it's concentrate on the, concentrate on the donut and not on the whole. That's great. And, I, I think it, it's probably still applicable for, you know, uh, diversity or women getting involved in things that are typically dominated by men or, or anything else. It's easy to get caught up in the battle, but the battle takes you away from uh, being, you know, so proficient that you're, you're going to succeed. On the results, you know, and, and that, and then I had a few in the eighties, if you read my book, um, I had a few issues with the team owner um, that, was the the distraction and uh and then I, I mean i almost retired from racing at the 24 hours of daytona the year that i won I, at two o'clock in the morning i called a friend in, in miami yeah. and said i've had it um i can't <laughs> do this anymore i can't put up with this anymore i am gonna, <laughs> serious i'm going to call a press conference and i am going to retire from racing he goes lynn first of all it's two o'clock in the morning and if you th if you hold you know hold a press conference nobody's going to show up on top of that, nobody cares whether you're racing or not racing. So, you know, whether you're going to retire is nothing more than your business. <laughs> Thirdly, are you going to let somebody else rob you of your passion? And I mean, that, that guy saved me, you know, because I would have been stupid. Thank God, they, thank God he answered the phone. Yeah. Oh, well, he was a really good guy. Well, so, so it kind of reminds me a little of that Ford versus Ferrari story. And I know that was romanced in the movie, but honestly, you know, you could see the pressure from the ownership group and the manufacturer Ford and, the, you know, uh, and, and then his, his lackey, you know, telling the driver how to behave or what to do. And then Shelby was getting pressure. I mean, it just... It's just well, and I mean, Ken, Ken Miles, the, the crap that he put up with and how yeah. he kept being overlooked. So the, one of the best other pieces that happened to me after the crash at Riverside, when I had to recover and I had to not do anything for a while, someone recommended that I read Peter Refson's book. And I did while I was hanging out doing nothing. And that was a huge breakthrough for me too, because the crap that he put up with in Formula One, because he was the pretty boy and he was the rich boy, 
that had come from the Revson family. And so he couldn't get respect. He couldn't get from his team and from, and, and I was reading that and I'm like, this has nothing to do with being a woman. This is just the way the sport is, you know? And so get over it, Lynn, you know, and get on with the work you have to do. So I had wonderful interceptions at critical points that kept me focused on the donut and not on the whole. Isn't it funny? We don't think of mentorship as that way. We think of mentorship more of, I've got this semi-formal or informal relationship with somebody who's always there for me. But what you're talking about is these critical moments in somebody's life or career that you reach out to somebody, a trusted person, and they give you sage advice or you get a resource. Wow, that it's, it's amazing how you could have turned left instead of right, and you know something would have been radically different. That's amazing. Uh, I well, I believe those people have, that have mentored me don't know they mentored me in many cases because right? I've just watched it. I you know I've asked a question. I mean Jim Busby, who I love dearly. I remember you know I was so frustrated. It was at Pocono, and I kept having bad deals going out of the car was blowing up and everything. And I I saw Jim and I said Jim give a few minutes, we were both on pit lane. And he goes, yeah, what's up? I said, would you walk down pit lane with me and tell me, point out one thing on every race car that we see, why it's a good race car or not a good race car. I need to know what to look for. And he did, he walked down, he told me about the center of gravity. He told me about the position of, the, of where the driver sits, you know, about the wheelbase, about, I mean, I learned more technically in that 10 minute walk down pit lane. You know? I mean, so I look at Jim Busby as one of my mentors, you know. <laughs> that 10 minutes. Yeah. So it's great. It's great to have these nuggets because, uh, you know, they're everywhere, but you do have to reach out. You have to ask, you have to humble you yourself. Do. And I, that's what I do tell the drivers, you know, and when I hear, oh, you know, I called so-and-so or I, I, and they didn't call me back. I mean, I, I found out from Dan Gurney, he doesn't, he didn't return a phone call if he didn't know the person until he got, until he got 10 messages from that person. <laughs> oh man. Well, so learn from that, you know, that's a lesson in itself. You have to yeah. be really incredibly persistent. That, if then, I, they, then they know you're serious. They know you are really, really serious. Uh, you mentioned Dan Gurney. I won't go there. He's He's probably means the most to me other than yourself and the, and just the race car family, because I have, I don't know. He just, he was in everything and I love Trans Am and I, you know, I have a Cougar XR7 and he, it's a Dan Gurney special. And, oh, wow. Uh, I so saw him at Peterson. Personalities. Yeah, you talk about personalities that make people unique and following it. I mean, he was, I would have voted for him for a president for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I got a sticker. <laughs> Hey, let's switch gears. I promised you we'd get off the traditional racing stuff. So here we go. Um, you're, you're, you were the president of Women's Sports Foundation and founded Women in the Winter Circle Project, Podium Grant. Tell us about these organizations and that you're such an integral part of probably to this day, I would imagine. Well, um, I was in, because of Anheuser-Busch racing in the Trans Am series, um, I got invited to go to New York to this Women's Sports Foundation, which I'd never heard of. This was back in the early 80s, uh, to this gala in New York. And it was the Women's Sports Foundation. I learned about it. I, I was an athlete there, um, an unknown athlete there. Most of them were very, you know, Olympic athletes and really successful. And of course, it was founded by Billie Jean King, who was one of my sheroes. And so to meet Billie Jean and to meet, meet, meet many of these other athletes, I'm like, holy cow. Well, long story short, I volunteered. I got involved in their, you know, on their advisory board. And next thing I know, I became their president, you know, because I, I do have a pretty good business head on my shoulders. Um, and so I, you know, I learned a lot about okay. how people, if you get people together, you can make change. It's really hard to make change by yourself. Right. It, takes, it takes a collective and it also takes men and women. What I loved about the Women's Sports Foundation, it wasn't about women changing this, the, 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 uh, the lives of women in sports. It was men and women working together to make that difference. And so I had a great mentoring experience through them. And then um, when I went to Indy, I got so much fan mail. I mean, I, I, didn't, I thought these people wanted advice. They just didn't want an autograph. And so over a year or so of that experience, I said, I have to do something. And I used the model of what I learned through the Women's Sports Foundation to create my own foundation and driver development program. 
And then I realized that so many other athletes get some types of grant or scholarships for them to be able to, you know, get resources to improve right. their ability to compete, um, that we needed to do something like that for women. So Paul Newman helped me start it. Um, when he gave me $10,000 to kind of start Project No Podium. kidding, Paul Newman, wow. Yeah. I raced often against and I ran into him. Uh, we were in a celebrity race at San Jose in, a, in this go-kart race. And he, yay, what have you been doing? What are you up to? And I said, oh, I'm trying to create this scholarship for women in racing. Send me the information. And I did. And, um, and I started that. And so I've now wow. worked with the Women's Sports Foundation are helping me, um, you know, sort of implement that. And, and then most recently, which has sort of elevated this importance, is that I've been nominated, accepted, whatever. I'm, I'm now on the ACUS board, which is the actual overseeing motorsports all in the United States, um, you know, representing the United States motorsports in, 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 internationally at the FIA. It's the American Competition Committee of the United States. And they've also then um, nominated me to represent the United States on the FIA Women in Motorsports Commission. So that work that I've been doing for the last 30 years, 25 or 30 years that has been, you know, ebb and flowed in, in their ability to do anything, I really feel has been great groundwork and great, it's given me rich experience and, and opportunity now to be able to bring it together and to bring it to the forefront uh, for the United States and, and to work in the internationally. So I'm mm. uh, pretty excited. I'm re-energized, uh, refocused and, um, and ready to, to make some changes. Wow, congratulations. What an honor. And, you know, I think it's encouraging for, you know, late life professionals. I'm, I'm certainly in that category. Um, you know, I, I started a business. I decided to become an entrepreneur five years ago and, and launch my business. But I, I think a lot of people look to, you know, these years as, hey, slow down, you know, you're just, you know, you're going to go travel the world and, you know, go see Italy five times or something. But I think what you're saying is you're really continuing to build on this um, platform that's uniquely you. And it, if you take advantage of it, it'll continue to provide you even greater opportunities to impact more people or pursue your passions, maybe in different ways. So I don't know, that's how I see it. I don't know if that's a fair- I think, I think you're right other than, I mean, I did go to Italy by the way, two years in 1970. <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, jealous. Well, I'd never been and it was Ferrari's 70th birthday and it was my 70th birthday. I said, I'm going to Italy and I'd never been. So that was the only time I've ever taken, because you know, when you talk about traveling the world, I got to travel the world when I was racing. So you know, yeah, that's right. really the motivation now, but I can't slow down. But what I'm absolutely unexpectedly pleased is that these opportunities are now coming to me um, as opposed to me fighting. You know, I've, I've right. been a, I'm known to be a fighter and I can really go after things but I, I, I just thought, you know, if, if the time's not right, then Lynn, understand that. Well, what I really am excited about is that these opportunities have come to me and including the Sebring Hall of Fame, you know, including wow. being honored, you know, this coming, uh, now it'll be in May, but to be honored, the honoree at Amelia Island Concours, I'm absolutely still in a state of shock. I mean, you look at those former recipients and the honorees, they're my heroes, you know? And, and I still am, I mean, every time I talk to Bill Warner, are you sure that you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and so so i i am re-energized i am not slowing down um and i'm i feel totally honored again now to be able congratulations to have these opportunities well i like i said i left so many things off the bios and amelia island what a what a incredible honor that is for sure Hey, I uh, want to do a quick shout out for our, one of our other sponsors, Wicked Mobile Detailing. Wicked's a luxury mobile detailing, paint restoration, and paint protection service right here in Southern California. They specialize in high-end paint correction, self-healing ceramic, and graphene coatings, clear bra, and many other services. Check out their YouTube channel, Wicked Auto Detailing, and see the professionalism, perfection, and an unbeatable customer service, which can always be expected from a Wicked service. Contact them at 617-901-1417 and give your car the devilish good looks it deserves. So you've been recognized, Lynn, by, you know, these organizations. We talked about a few, uh, Mealy Island and, uh, you know, Sebring, but NASCAR, Automotive News, SEMA, Sports Illustrated for Women, Working Women. You know, I could keep going, but we're going to run out of time. 
what what does all this mean to you? How do you process all that? It was kind of like you listening to your bio. And now if you think back about all the recognition and they're they're still coming, what how does it how do you respond? Well, um, first of all, I'm humbled and blown away. But what I have learned, you know, um, I think I learned this the best lesson, I not the best, but the, the the experience that taught me this lesson better than anything other time. After I did Indy in 92, I mean, I, you know, I mean, that was a big deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and getting rookie of the year, I mean, that was a huge deal. So like four or five days, literally four or five days after the 500, you know, the Detroit race is usually the next race. Yeah. And I was still a factory driver for, four, I was actually still, a, an ambassador for Ford Motor Company. So I got hired to go to Detroit to help promote the Detroit Grand Prix. And I showed up on, it was like Wednesday after the race. It's like three days after the race. Yeah. You're and still I, processing well, just, you know, driving in the race, right? I, well, I'm still on, you know, cloud nine, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, and so I'm around all these other, you know, indie drivers and Trans Am drivers and all these drivers I know, Scott Pruitt and all these guys. And I'm like, hey guys, you know, and they go, hey Lynn, how you doing? And they all start talking and nobody, Nobody mentions the Indy 500. And finally I said, hey, so did anybody watch the Indy 500? <laughs> do you go, oh yeah, that's right, Lynn. Yeah, hey, congratulations. I mean, <laughs> no freaking big deal. And that was a huge, you know, boom because the world doesn't change when yeah. great things happen, you know? And it, it, the, the world changes for you. And so I look at every one of these honors like I am, I am absolutely blown away and appreciative. And, and, but at the same time, I realize we get up the next day, we go to work. Yeah. And then next year, there will be another honoree. You know, you're only as good as your last race. Yeah. You are, you know, I, so I'm not trying to diminish the impact of these yeah. wonderful things. But at the same time, I've learned that they, they feel really good at the moment and they mean a lot but I also don't get carried away because they aren't going to change the world and they aren't even going to change what it is I'm trying to change. You know? Well, it's interesting how your peers weren't slapping you on the back. You thought you were being punked, but maybe that's how they were able to stay focused and get ready for the next race and the next race by, you know, always keeping their, you know, their perspective forward, but you probably felt like you're, you were that guy and that well, you, you, you just cut, in baseball and, and nobody high-fived you. <laughs> you just cut them more slack than I think they deserve, to be honest. But anyway, I, I, uh, anyway, I, I learned a great lesson that time. I'm sure you did. Well, fantastic. What a career. So, hey, tell us a little bit about your book, An Incredible Journey. Is that your latest book? And do you have another book planned? Uh, no, no. I, um, <laughs> they're hard. Uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work and time consuming. I gained like 10 pounds. I mean, I was like, I told my, the gal working for me at that time, I said, if I ever say I'm going to do another book, lock me in a closet <laughs> because I, it's not, it's not easy. Um, well, the book is a revision of the original book. The original book was called um, The Ride of Your Life. It was published by Hyperion. And to be honest, it didn't sell that well because it was in the uh, transportation books in the bookstores. And of course that whole industry has changed anyway. So I, I got the rights back. I've updated some things. It's really about my racing life and not about my complete life. Um, and I'm self-published and you know, it's available on my website. And so it just tells the story from the Pinto all the way through to the last Indy 500. And so, um, and it's, you know, I've heard people that have read it. Um, not everybody reads them that buy them, but I understand that. Um, but everybody that's read it has given me great positive feedback and enjoy it. And I think it, it you know, it, it, it fills in a lot of holes that the media or that other people just didn't know about. Um, and so I, it, I'm glad I did it, but I have no plans of doing another one. <laughs> well, I don't know. The, the book 10 sounds probably less uh, impactful than the COVID-20 or, you know, whatever I <laughs> yeah. myself, I'm not quite sure. I'm proud of the, the other one you mentioned, which is called, Oh, by the way. And that, that is a book. All that is, is a reprint of a letter that my mother wrote me No kidding. on my 40th birthday. And, wow. um, and it's, it's a jewel. It's one of these great gift books. that yeah. just really, it really captures, um, advice and big thinking, but yet in a very precise, kind, sweet way. Well, if you ever slow down, you wind up in Sicily or, you know, somewhere on the uh, Nepali coast, you could take a year and gain 10 and do another one. I'm sure <laughs> what it would love to 
So everybody get out there, read Lynn's books. They're awesome. I speak from experience. She's an incredible writer. So, hey, tell us a little bit more of, um, about motivational speaking. You do a, quite a bit of that as I uh, read through, you know, some of the companies that you've, uh, you know, shared your expertise with. Uh, what got you into that and how much do you enjoy that? Tell us about that journey, if you will. Well, I can tell you that I used to break out in a rash if I had to talk to more than three people at one time. Okay. I mean, that is the truth. When I was the race director of SCCA, <laughs> the Florida region of SCCA, they would tease me and they'd go, watch it. I'd get this rash and it would just come <laughs> They'd watch you. They yeah, watch, they'd this. watch it, you know, and I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> so um, I was not a natural speaker. Um, and then when I got Ford as a sponsor in 1981, one of the very first non-racing jobs they gave me was to speak to the Shelby Club. And, and I was and they had their national convention in, in Dearborn. And there was like a thousand people. And I wasn't a keynote, but I was supposed to get up and be one of the speakers. And they wanted, yeah. you get that they wanted me to pitch or to kind of get these these hardcore Shelby fans excited about four cylinder engines <laughs> because that's what they had in the escort. And you know, that was what they were promoting at that time. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I was a nervous wreck um, and I, I made it through. I know it was, I'm sure it was horrible, but <laughs> what happened was it became a necessity in my relationship with Ford Motor Company. And so I said to myself, you gotta figure this out. You have got to get over it and you have to figure it out. So with the help of the people that worked at Rod Campbell's company, Campbell and Company, that with the PR firm for Ford, they, you know, they would book me and they would send a rep with me. And we got over the hurdles of the first few, but I'll never forget it was in Boston for the SBA, the Small Business Association. I got a standing ovation. No way. That must have felt so amazing. It was. And I and I it was because I didn't read anything. I just went off script. I just, I realized that you have to have something to say and you have to find somebody in the audience to tell that story or to, to, to say, you don't worry about the whole audience. You know, you just find, well, somebody said you have to find two or three people. So you move your eyes. But anyway, I just got over it and, you know, and I, and I, obviously it got better and better, I hope, but, um, and so it, sure it, it is. I learned it because it was a necessity. I knew that that was important to Ford. And if I was going to be able to keep them as a sponsor, you know, I wanted to keep racing. Um, and you can't rely on the race because, you know, you'd have a great race and then you, you'd have a great season and then you have a shitty season, you know. So yeah. it was real. And I had one year contracts with Ford. So I had to really hit as many home runs in as many areas as I possibly could to be able to renew a contract. How, how, how has COVID impacted that part of what Lynn does, you know, on an average day? Are you, are you finding that, you know, it, they, zero, zero. I've had zero speaking engagements. I mean, and you don't get paid to do Zoom. To do <laughs> meeting, you know? Right. So, um, yeah. So it has had a huge impact. Nine Eleven had a huge impact. Because I'm sure it did. Problem. Yeah. So yeah. you know, right now, to, it's very difficult to say that's my. It's not my primary, you know, um, career. Right. It, it supplements or augments, you know. And I'm always so. Hey, if anybody needs a speaker out there, let me know. You know, because it's it is a great way to keep my boat afloat. <laughs> People get out there and hire Lynn Stat as soon as uh, as soon as it's safe to come out of the COVID yeah. closet, if you will. Right. Is that okay to say that? I guess so. I just said it. But uh, yeah, I, you know what? It's just storytellings. I think you mentioned that my father was a sales guy, and um, you know, and and of course, salespeople get little to no respect. But he sold insurance, <clears throat> car insurance, and. Uh, Everybody loved my dad. He was just one of those guys. Everybody wanted to be around my dad. And, you know, he, he didn't have any, you know, he told a few jokes, but I think he was just a gifted storyteller. And some people have that ability. And it sounds like you probably had it, but, you, you know, you had, to, you had to let it come out and flourish. And, what, you know, what a great way to engage people, I think. Well, racing really brought out a whole different part of my personality. I mean, you know, I, I really used to be very, very shy, but I think I found my strength or my purpose or my confidence as a person through racing, because you have to be confident when you're behind the wheel of a race car. You can't go, oh, I wonder if I'm going to do that path. You know, it just doesn't work. So 
Uh, but then I didn't get over the shyness part be because obviously even after I raced when I was the Florida regional, I mean, the Florida region of SCCA's our race director, I was still very, very shy about talking to people. But so it's, you know, we're all a work in progress. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're, yeah, I always tell my son that we're, we're cause if we're self-aware, we're always trying to get better at so many things in our life. Yeah. Lives, right? So, hey, hey one other thing that um, we didn't talk much about, but. What about, I, I hate to boil it down, but is there any one piece of advice you'd give to men or women that want to pursue racing or, or you know, it's, they're passionate about it, but, um, you know, not one foot in, one foot out. It, it sounds like, to me, it's one of those things like pursuing art or entertainment. It, it sounds like the odds of succeeding are, are somewhat small. But at the same time, how do you encourage people to, you know, continue to move forward with such incredibly overwhelming odds? That's a really good question, actually, because, and there really is no good answer. But um, other than, you know, figure out why. Why do you really want to do it? Um, if you understand what your objective is or the, the reason, your, your reasoning. You know, I, I worked with a lot of young drivers, over 200 of them over the course of my driver development program. And, and I was a bit shocked on some of it. You know, some of it was, you know, they wanted to be famous. They, the, some of it, they, they, they saw an opportunity because in most cases, they may have been the only female in that type of racing in that part of the country or whatever. And they were used to getting, you know, getting some exposure and stuff. So, you know, first of all, no, it's hard. It's hard for everybody. I mean, it is a very difficult sport. It's a very expensive sport. If you don't have the resources, and even if it's just on a minimal, I mean, like my Pinto, I mean, I, ha I, I used to go to the tire store in the local tire store in Fort Lauderdale and buy takeoff tires, tires that people took off their car to replace with new ones because it only had a few 30 seconds left on it, which yeah. would get me through one day or one, maybe a weekend, depending on how much was there. So be creative, understand that it's hard, but understand if you don't have the resources, then don't complain about the fact that it's that hard because it's hard for everybody. Yeah, um, it's an equal playing field from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. and understand how how to build on those resources. Understand your your own your own reasoning why you're doing it, and then understand that you can't do it alone. So find and this is really most in, in any type of endeavor is create your your network of supporters, your network of 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 mentors or whatever you want to call them, but, you know, have your own personal board of directors, you know, be willing to reach out and ask for help from others, because particularly early on, most people are willing to help you until you beat them. <laughs> <laughs> if you put that down somewhere, <laughs> that's yeah, cool. you know, and, and, but also understand that you may not always get good advice. So I always would ask more than one, particularly early on, yeah. I would ask more than one person the same question because I, you know, if you, sometimes you're not always getting the right skinny, you know, so you. you wow. Well, okay. Well, sounds like great advice for you. Bottom line, bottom line is, sorry, is to, have fun, is to have fun. If you aren't having fun, then you aren't a happy person. <laughs> I don't know. How could you not have fun as a race car driver? Maybe you're working too hard or Maybe, maybe you're the Todd Marinovich of racing where you were groomed from three to be, a, you know, a quarterback or a race car driver. At some point you stop having fun, but it, it just sounds like so much fun. I mean, but that's great advice. If you're not having fun, you got to look in the mirror and go, maybe not. What are we doing? Yeah, why? Yeah. That's, so, that's, uh, that's my advice because I, I as, as, as rough as many, many, I mean, crashes and I'm, I could go on and on and on with bottom line is when I'm at a racetrack, I just show up at a racetrack, even if I'm not driving and everything gets going, all my juices start flowing and I'm a happy camper. Yeah. You're in your happy place as they I'm say. I'm in my happy place. Yeah. Awesome. So if folks want to contact you, hire you uh, for, you know, speaking engagements, uh, learn more about you. Where, where do they go on you the go to, internet or social you my, media? You go to my website, lynnstjames.com. One N, no, you know, L Y N S T J A M E S dot com. I answer all my own inquiries. So those, when you say contact and you send a message or whatever, I get it. Um, and obviously, if you go to the website, uh, is the best way um, to be honest because I'm on Facebook, but I don't understand half the time what I'm not. Ex I'm not an expert at social media. 
Um, and I don't like Messenger because there's just, I've had a lot of fraud, identity fraud. I've had a lot of issues over, over time. Sure. So the best way is to go to my website. And, um, and, and that on my website is my phone number and my email address. And, you know, I'm here. Well, <clears throat> if you're smart, you'll reach out to Lynn because uh, your, your life's adventures and your career and where you're headed, uh, it's all so very exciting and uh, inspirational. So I can't thank you enough for sharing it with us today, Lynn. That was a great, and I'm going to say high-speed ride. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, it was fun. Oh, man. We've learned so much today, and we're just thankful to have Lynn as our guest. And for those of you watching us, don't forget all of our episodes are on all that social media stuff Lynn mentioned, uh, particularly our YouTube channel, the SoCal Car Scene, all separate words, where you can see videos of our awesome guests like Lynn. So please watch, follow, most importantly, subscribe. Hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. And if you prefer to listen to these episodes, please go to all your favorite podcast platforms like Apple, iTunes, Stitcher, Buzzsprout, Google Play, and the SoCal Car Storage forward slash SoCal Car Scene page. Thanks so much for listening and watching. So that is a wrap, Lynn. <laughs>